Hello and welcome to Just One More Watch. Welcome today to my second bite at the particularly large and juicy cherry that is the Invicta 1953. When I reviewed this one for the first time last year, it was genuinely hard to get a hold of. It was that hot, one of the hottest budget watches of the year for sure. Fast forward 15 months and it's still pretty hard to track down one of these, at least in the original black bezel form. I think Invicta quite sensibly launched another range of these, a whole bunch of different bicolored bezels late last year, and I picked one up in December, and it has been waiting patiently in the queue for review ever since. So, does the Invicta still make sense as a $99 dive watch purchase in 2021, and how does it compare to some of the other budget retro dive watches that I have reviewed in the intervening period. Let's flip the camera and find out. All right, let's get on with it. I must say though, I'm a little bit miffed today. This is the second one of these I bought and it doesn't come with the <clears throat> signature yellow Invicta box. Invicta packaging, to be honest, kind of self-destructs the moment you touch it. This actually looks sturdier than the yellow boxes, so I shouldn't really be complaining too much. And there is Invicta 1953 and a half, the second one I have purchased. And as you can see, I went for the two-tone Coke style bezel. So where did I get it from? Well, actually I got it from Invicta themselves direct from the USA. As you can see here from the email, I ordered it in December last year. So it has taken me some time to get around to reviewing this one, as I said, and two weeks later, they sent it to me in January, just as well somebody got a lengthy two week break over Christmas, isn't it? Never mind, it arrived in good shape and here it is. So I thought I may as well do a bit of an unboxing, a kind of sticker peeling session before I go through the dimensions and specs and let you know whether I think it's still worth picking up one of these in the middle of 2021. So let's peel off some stickers. And finally the dial protector. Looks like there's one on the case back as well. And there we go, and I'm pleased to tell you it is still a clean and handsome looking watch. And a watch that is more readily available than it was last year when I reviewed it. Joma Shop, for example, has all of these new bicolored bezel, the two-tone bezels. And there are a few of them, there are four different ones available, all floating around the 100. I'm not quite sure why there's a difference in price between the different colors. They've even got an old black one. Now, I want to hate the old black one, but I don't. I think it looks all right. Interestingly, the only one they don't have, though, is the OG, the original one that I got last year. So yeah, it looks like that particular model is still quite hot. All right, so we're back, we're sized and we're set, but what actually are we looking at? Well, clearly this is a homage to the original Rolex Submariner from 1953, hence 1953 on the dial there. There is a bit of a clue and they are very similar. Admittedly, these new two-toned bezel variants do modernize the look somewhat, but it's still very retro. They've carried over the original hands, clearly different from a contemporary Submariner hands. These ones are very thin pencil hands with a rather unusual lollipop tipped second hand, whisper it quietly, I prefer the Mercedes of the more modern variants, but there you go. Other than that, it is pretty similar. It is not the big triangle at 12, batons at three, six and nine circles everywhere else, and a very distinct gilt minute track. Gold handset here as well, so yeah, definitely retro. 14 mil in diameter, it's a bit of a chubber, 14 mils thick, 48.7 mil lug to lug, I'm gonna say, yeah, somewhere between 48 and 49. 20 millimeter lug width, tapering down to 17 and a half, back up to 19 and a half at the clasp, sized up for me, seven inch wrist, 139 grams. So a very familiar set of dimensions. All stainless steel construction, it's an unguarded, Stainless steel screw down crown, just like the original 53 sub, 200 meters of water resistance with this one. That's actually a really nice coin edge bezel. I'll zoom in on that later on. The bracelet is okay. Reasonable brushing on the upper surfaces, a little bit rough, but you don't get much for 95 bucks these days hollow end links. However, there's a couple of kind of technical drawbacks to this one. The hollow end links being one and this 
cheap and nasty pressed clasp being the other. At least they give you a decent spread of four micro adjusts that clearly spans the distance between links. Zoomed in so you can have a look at the finish and the finish is actually quite pleasant for a watch costing just around $100. It is miles better than the Invicta Pro Diver. I wouldn't honestly recommend anyone to buy an Invicta Pro Diver these days, not while this one is available. So horizontal brushing on the mid case, lovely high polished chamfered edge running all the way to the tips of those lugs. It's a decent crown there with the Invicta logo etched into it and that coin edge bezel very, very nicely finished. Like I said, the finishing overall much better than I was expecting and this one is no different to the last one I looked at. Well, I may not have got the signature yellow box, but I did get the signature yellow rotor. Very nice touch, I have to say, on a watch at less than $100, a full custom rotor for the NH35. 24 joule hacking and hand winding bi-direction winding movement by Seiko. Definitely what you would hope for in a watch at this price and the, the custom rotor is a bit of a bonus. Screw on stainless steel case back with a mineral display there showing you they're proud of the yellow. And let's have a look at the dial and hands macro outside. Look, it's a good looking watch. Why? Because it's not really an Invicta design, is it? And they haven't been tempted to cover it with Invicta logos, Invicta branding in some of the ways that they do with their other watches. Just the three lines of text, Invicta in gilt underneath the big triangle, 1953 also in gold and automatic in red. I think that nicely picks out the red bottom half of this aluminium bezel insert. It's just an aluminium insert. Again, it wouldn't have looked good if it had been ceramic because ceramic bezel inserts were only added to the Submariner in the 2010s. It's kind of a matte finish as well, which I think suits the overall look, but gilt handset, gilt indices surrounds, and that gilt minute track around the outer edge, helping with that retro feel. Plenty of loom on those indices and the hands as well. This is one of Invicta's own looms. It's not borrowed from Seiko, or it's certainly not Super Luminova. It kind of has the look of of C3 old radium style though, and it has the inherent difficulties that C3 old radium style has, which is it isn't all that bright initially and doesn't last as long as regular C3, but for less than a hundred bucks, I'm not gonna complain about the loom here. It's certainly up to standard of pretty much anything else at the price point. And it wears well, I must say. It is a little bit thick at 14 mil, but it manages to disguise that fairly well. And the inverted mid links of the end link, I think, are always a bonus. I don't know why more companies do that. Guys with big wrists, it's not gonna matter to them, but guys with slightly smaller than average wrists will really appreciate the instant taper, the instant drop they get from a bracelet with inverted mid links. I think it's a bit of a no brainer. As I said, I don't know why more companies don't do it. Overhead shot, those hands may be pencil slim, but they are still fairly legible, I reckon. And that legibility continues when you take the watch outside in natural light. Just a mineral crystal covering the dial, and I'm not sure how much anti-reflective undercoating, if any, there is, but because of the kind of gilt hands with that 14 odd look against the black dial, it's still pretty visible from all angles. On wrist, reasonably well balanced at 140 grams. The head of the watch is perhaps slightly top heavy, slightly bobbly. You're probably gonna wear this one one notch tighter than you would if it was a bit lighter. And looking down the wrist, yeah, you can see what I mean. It could have done with a few mil being shaved off the thickness as well, but overall it is still eminently wearable. All right, what are my moans and niggles with this one then? Well, there are a couple of technical deficiencies that I've already covered. Those being the cheap hollow end links, the cheap rattly press clasp, and the mineral crystal. I must have looked at 30 watches at less than $100 that feature sapphire crystal, so it's certainly not a major expense. You're just gonna have to take those compromises though if you do want one of these. Then there are some of these new colors with the bicolor bezel. I think some of them are better than others. Some of them are more convincing than others. The orange one, for example, the green one, I reckon that doesn't quite work. There's too much of a clash between that contemporary color and the deeply retro dial on them. I'd be sticking with the more traditional Coke and Pepsi style ones. I don't mind the black, like I said, or stick with the original all black aluminum bezel insert instead. And then of course, there's the fact that since I last reviewed this watch in April last year, I have reviewed a number of other retro divers, including the San Martin 
SN004, an absolutely stunning little watch. It was smaller than this at 38mm and more in line with the styling of the slightly later 1957 Submariner, as you can see it has Mercedes hands. Admittedly, it's $235, $240, so it is a lot more than this. I'll leave links to everything I'm talking about in the description of the video. If you have got the extra cash, the San Martin is worth spending the extra cash. Overall, a higher quality product. However, if you've got a strict budget of $99, I still highly rate this watch. I think it looks good. Couple of compromises, but it wears well. 200 meters of water resistance, Seiko, you know, it's going to run for years and years, this one. And I think overall, it's a nice package. It isn't really let down by any of these little technical foibles. So then, perhaps not as smoking hot as it was last April, but if you are in the market for one of these, I still think you can buy with confidence. For $100, there aren't too many better dive watches out there than this one. So there you have it. Well done for making it all the way to the bitter end. If you are considering buying the Invicta 1953, then you should definitely check out my original review. You should also probably check out the review of that San Martin as well. Thanks for watching. I'll see you all soon.